Hey, let's talk about some news in baseball today. What did you think of uh, Pablo Lopez going from Miami to Minnesota? Because uh, the Cardinals have been linked to him, whether accurately or not, they've been linked to him. Yeah, well, that's, you know, they. I guess Minnesota had, had more to offer. I mean, the Cardinals, I'm sure, had been had offered players for him. And uh, is he, you know, a complimentary pitcher? Is he a, a top-of-the-rotation guy? I'm not quite sure about that. I, the Cardinals need to probably have somebody better than that, but he he's better than some of the guys they have, I will say that. And I, yeah, I don't know where he he fit, he would fit. I don't think he's a, he's not a number one guy. Probably a two, maybe a three. It depends on the rotation. Uh, do you think we, we all know that the way Bill DeWitt Jr. and and uh, John Mozeliak think about their rotation? I mean, a lot of it still is based on, as Bill DeWitt said, we hope Jack Flaherty's this, we hope that, you know. So they're still putting a lot of things on hoping. How? Uh, after hearing what they had to say, I mean, what's your opinion of their confidence in this rotation? I'm not as confident as they are. Uh, I think there's enough guys to fill it out. But who's your lead dog? Uh, you've got the the Flaherty, and the Flaherty's had one spectacular season. The second half of 19 and the first half of 21, he was as good as anybody in the game. That's one out of five so far. Um, I like Michaelis as a your number two guy. He could be he matches up with a lot of twos. And Montgomery, we think is going to be good. Mass, I think will be good. Wainwright, we don't know. And Hudson, I think will be better. So they're they're okay there. They have you know in a four game series they'll be fine, and, and if it had the five game series they'd be fine. But for one game. You know, if you're going up against their other guys, other team's best guy, they don't have that guy yet. They don't. And um, uh, to their credit, they they sort of upgraded uh, their in their search last uh, late July when they were scrambling again. And even though Lester and Hap did a fine job for the Cardinals in 21, you know, Quintana and Montgomery were – a lot better. So I don't I, I don't know how many big name pitchers are going to get traded late this season. I was listening to a conversation, uh, Jim Duquette and others talking on the MLB network satellite radio, and they were saying that it's pretty interesting because it, you know their sense. I mean, the Soto trade was really big, but they're wondering whether general managers across the industry are more reluctant now than they used to be about either trading a big name guy. I'm talking about good teams or whatever, or, but, but maybe on the other end, there's um, there's a hesitancy to give up too much or be perceived as giving up too much at the deadline to try to get a big fish. And I don't know how I feel about that, but it was an interesting observation by a couple of guys that actually did work as GMs. Um, uh, I I don't I you know and I can't compare the the trade deadline last year to other years I mean just can't do it off the top of my head but what do you think about that theory that big trades may be less likely uh, in in this current climate? Well, it, it seems like you don't see many pitchers of of high octane moved at, at that juncture you know unless they're guys like Quintana who's you know a, a back end of the rotation guy he was. Cardinals best guy at the end of the season but if you put him on this staff right now and said where is he where does he rank he'd rank about four you know he doesn't he doesn't rank one or two or maybe three Montgomery ranked one for the from them for a while uh and you know you're not going to get Verlander or Scherzer or Rodon or any of those guys you they're on the free agent market the last couple of years in a trade but there might be a guy that can and get you over the hump, you know, for only two months like Montgomery did. Uh, and maybe you got him signed for next year too, you know. Uh, but I, I, you're more likely to see a position player move like a Soto or Josh Bell was a big-name position player too, just that being the same trade. Um, but I, I think I agree with them. Um, but you still have to get that guy somehow, and then now it's a trade. And you don't have to get him just in April, but you better get him before the, the playoffs start. Yeah, no, no doubt about it. So it's going to be interesting. Yeah, sometimes I, I you know, and I, I wrote something about this for Scoops, Danny Mac, kind of, kind of hard on the Cardinals. And I'm going to get to this a little later in the show, but 
You know, I looked at what their record in the NL Central's been during this uh, four-year um, playoff, going to the playoff run, and it, it's uh, there's such a huge difference in their winning percentage. Uh, you know, in within the Central, and then outside the Central, and it's it's almost as if they they have they have sort of developed this like f- false sense of how good they really are you know because then they go get hammered in the postseason and it's almost like and I talk about this a lot probably too much it's almost like the you know the NL Central works against them in some ways obviously the NL Central works for them because it's much easier to win the division or at least pile up wins to get into the postseason but once you get there you're you know maybe your flaws are exposed so I don't know whether the NL Central's a help or a hindrance because I think it causes management to be a little complacent. I mean, how do you see that? And if you disagree with me, uh, it won't be the first time, so please do if you do. Well, this year it's a tremendous hindrance because of all the rules changes and stuff that have, are on the table and will be executed in spring training or, or at least tried out for re- presumed regular season use. A new schedule will hurt the Cardinals tremendously because – as opposed to playing Pittsburgh and the Reds 19 times, if you played them 13 times, so you've lost 12 games with those two bottom feeders, which is probably nine wins. Sure. You look over at the Eastern Division, and let's say the Mets, Phillies, and Braves only have to play 13 games against each other rather than 19. Wouldn't you rather have that if you were them? Yeah. Right. Would you rather have 19 games with the Pittsburgh and the Reds for the Cardinals? Yeah, you bet. So. There's, it's going to be hard to win 90 games. I didn't even include the Cubs in that, you know, against poor teams. They might be a poor team, too. You have only uh, 13 games with them. You have, uh, you'll have you miss 18 games against those three teams, which, are, you know, it's, it's got to be 12 wins. They're going to – 12 and 6 is, is – you know, it's at 6 plus 6 you're not going to have. Maybe that's 93 to 87 wins if it's in so good. Yeah, the the Cardinals in in their in, in terms of their American League docket this coming season. I, I was curious about this because I hadn't done any homework on it. You know, they're going to play um, seventeen total games against the six American League squads that made it to the postseason last year: Astros, Yankees, Blue Jays, Mariners, Guardians, and Rays. All six made the playoffs. So then, if you look at the games they play, they're going to play against uh, National League teams that made the playoffs, uh, 32 total games. So about 30% of their schedule in 2023 is going to be against teams that made it uh, to the playoffs along with them last season. That's a lot of games. Yeah, and just, you know, that that difference between 19 and 13 to me is just enormous in that we're not playing Pittsburgh and the Reds as many times because you know you got – wins come, especially when you get to Pittsburgh. They all, they just roll over them in Pittsburgh. And uh, as, as another, you know, side effect of the new schedule, the Cubs will be here for one series this year. And they play the Cubs 13 games, seven in Chicago, two series in Wrigley. Cardinals play two series with the Cubs as considered home games, but two of them are in London. So the other four, one series is here. Ah, man. That, I didn't even realize that, but you're, you're absolutely right, of, of course. Yeah, it's going to be an interesting 2023. It really is. But they they're, they just seem a little too content to me anyway, and I do appreciate all the success they've had. They just seem a little too pleased with themselves based on beating up uh, and collecting cupcakes in the NL Central, you know? And I, I just think that's a bad – that's kind of a bad way to look at it. Well, we're, we're fine. We, you know, we're going to win game. We're going to win the central. We're going to do. You know, at some point they just got to take a stronger, uh, a stronger club into the postseason. I think just what we talked about with starting pitching, but other things as well. Well, we got a pretty good read on the on the Cardinals. The first home stand you get Toronto and the Braves. That's a couple of mashers coming in here, man. If you got that's right. If you win three or three of those six games, you've done pretty well. And there's no doubt. There's no doubt about it. Hey, Commissioner, I want to ask you about a player that uh, is a curiosity to me because I'm not sure where he's going to fit, but I also wonder could he be surprisingly good if he got a chance to settle in. And that that's Alec Burleson. 
Now, part of this, I admit to you, my friend, is that uh, my friend Dan Zimborski of uh, Fangraphs, you know, he comes out with those Zips projections, which are always interesting to me. It's just fun. And that Zips forecast really likes Alec Burleson. And he, and he, and he has a great, had a great swing at AAA and just crushed right-handed pitching. But where does he fit in? I mean, there, there, is a, there is a bit of a jam in the outfield, especially, you know, obviously if you include Jordan Walker in there at some point this season. What about Alec Burleson? Well, it's hard to rate him because for the first time in his life, he wasn't an everyday player when he got to the big leagues. You know, he, he, had, he played every day in Memphis. And the year before, he played every day at, at several locations, including Memphis. And here, he was playing a couple times a week, and he didn't do very well. Well, a lot of guys have a hard time playing a couple days a week. Donovan can do it, but, but right. this guy couldn't. And even Yepes would play more often than that. I mean, so I don't know what Burleson's – what his expectations should be. I don't know if he makes the club even, um, unless he plays a lot. Right. I don't like him as, the, as a – as a part-time player, I think he needs to be playing every day, and that means going back to Memphis. That's what it's going to be. It's uh, no, I, I I certainly see that as well because it's a uh, it's a crowded outfield unless they use him as a left-handed designated hitter, and that's the one thing that's a, a little bit of an X factor. They seem like they're going to really stick with Gorman at second base, and he's been working hard at it. He always has. And, you know, I don't know if he'll be okay there without the shift and all that stuff. But if they keep Gorman there for a lot of the games, uh, then Burleson could emerge as a, as a left-handed DH type to, to, to be matched with uh, Yepes. I mean, that's one way to look at it. Although I know Yepes actually did better against right-handed pitching last year than left-handed pitching. Where do you have Donovan playing then? I know, right? Yeah. So yeah, on cool. one on one hand, the Cardinals have too much talent. I guess they do in terms of some guys that are pretty good players, and not going to be enough spots for them. No, I mean, uh, I'd rather see Donovan at second base and Gorman as a DH because they're better defensively that way. Right uh, now, it's, it's awful hard to to put a guy who's you know twenty three, twenty four years old as your DH. He sh- I mean, he he can play. I'd like to see him play the outfield Gorman sometime, but I don't know. I haven't heard that talked about. So I guess he's a second baseman or he's a DH. And, uh, I, you know, the guy had 30 home runs last year. That's good enough for me. You know, I know he struck out a lot, but it was his first year in the big leagues. Um, I, I wouldn't. I, people seem to have given up on him, or some people anyway. I haven't. Yeah, I haven't either. It kind of makes me a little uh, ticked off that there's so many people dismissive of him, you know, so – it's going to be 23 years old this year, you know? Yeah. <laughs> just, and all you got to do is go to baseball reference and look at his career trajectory. Everywhere he, every stop he made along the way in their system, he was flailing away, really struggling at first. And then he works hard, he's smart, made adjustments, and then got on track. So he's followed that pattern everywhere he's been, every level of the minors. And it was much the same uh, last year in St. Louis. Except this time, it was uh, the, the the traditional major league thing. You know, he could hit fastballs early, and then they figured out some things, and he got a little overwhelmed. But that that's not uh, that's not rare. That's pretty that's pretty common. Oh yeah, he had 19 in bats against left-handed pitching, so we don't have a real good read on that. Or they've made made a decision that he's not ready to hit left-handed pitching yet, maybe. Uh, and when you have Yepes and some other guys around, uh, you have the opportunity to make Gorman hit only against right-handed pitchers. He had, you know, 11 of his 14 home runs came with two strikes, which I think is pretty significant, but then he had two strikes a lot. <laughs> Kamish, um, if, if, you know, just based on, you know, you keeping tabs of the winter warm-up in terms of just uh, reading and listening, maybe talking to some people, because I don't know if you were actually down there or not, so I apologize. I down there one but, day, yeah. Um, yeah, what, what were there a couple three things that you pull away from what you heard during the winter warm up? Some information or something that was being said about a particular player? What caught your ear, so to speak? Well, I guess this was probably said before the warm up, but maybe expounded on at the warm up was that Newtbar is the regular outfielder. He's of the, of the three regular guy, three guys that you think are the regular outfielders. 
he's the only one who was actually advertised as a regular outfielder. And, you know, because he could play center, probably. We didn't see much of that. And, of course, he played right field very well. And he, I'm, I'm sure he could play left field, too. But he's too good to be in left field. So that's the thing I took away is that he's a regular player. They, that, you know, his, whatever his batting average was for the whole season last year is 240-something. They, they dismissed that because of his second-half power and his ability to get on base and, and walk. And maybe he can steal bases, too. That might help. At the, if, it, it, in my mind, the only question is, does he hit first? Or does he hit fifth? You know, is he the guy you want to protect, Arnado? Well, maybe. But is he the guy you want to have leading off the game, maybe hitting a home run or getting a, a walk or a single and starting a rally? Well, maybe he's better off there. Yeah, I, that's a really good question. I mean, I, I think their offense, one of the things, they, one of the reasons why they started to take off is because they, they were batting him at the top. And, he, you know, he, gosh, he gets on base. He's, he's – is a guy, you know, the I would think the old schoolers uh, would love him because, you know, when he finally got in that lineup, like early July, where where he was pretty much playing every day or most most every day, you know, his his strikeout rate and and walk rate were about the same, you know, and that and you don't you just don't see that much anymore where uh, a guy's not going to strike out all that much, but he's going to walk a lot. And you look at the list and it's like, well, heck, he only had like three more strikeouts and walks. So he's a real. I mean, he's a, he's definitely an on base machine type guy, and he seems like he can. He's got no fear of uh, batting against left handed pitchers either. What's well, stunning that a guy that big would be a good on base guy. You know, when we were growing up, every leadoff guy was five foot nine. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's right. Um, Kamish, I I, I want to ask you a music question. I, every week, I try to maybe throw you a little uh, change up. But earlier this week, uh, David Crosby died of Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young at age 81. Were you a CSNY fan? Uh, to a degree. I mean, I, I enjoyed listening to that music, and he was with the Birds, too, before that. So uh, I enjoyed him. I, he wasn't one of my all-time favorites, probably, but I was, I was sad to hear that he had died. And there's been quite a few of those fellows died in the last couple, three years. First, they're all 70 and 80 years old. That's going to happen. <laughs> Yeah, he he had a colorful life, that's for sure. So, but he was um, that distinctive voice and just a great songwriter. I very much love that song "Wooden Ships," you know, because it sort of brings out all their just their musical gifts, but also their vocal gifts. So, anyway, I wanted to run that by you, man. I'm going to do that from now on. Well, I, I know they have to be older singers now. The newer singers, I won't be have much help for you. <laughs> Well, I'll keep that in mind too. So we'll we'll we uh, you know I I won't like ask you I won't engage you in a discussion about what the real meaning is of like a shaggy song or something like that. So you know I'll I'll, no, I'll try I, to. I would not be of any help whatsoever. <laughs> Kamish, I love you. We'll talk next week. Okay. You got it, man. All right, all right buddy. That's our friend Rick Hummel, longtime colleague from the Post Dispatch STL today. See, I knew he was going to be retired. Uh, not in the traditional. He'll, Partially retired, but I like to hear that he was down there at um at the winter warm up. See, I love him on the his, show. His, I know, man. His perspective is just great. Uh, said, I'm sorry, but what he said, no, you know, all the leadoff hitters used to be five nine. I just started laughing because it's so true. <laughs> I know. Well, like, who were sorry? That's that's a question for our audience, our dear audience. Who were some of the short, shorter, or short leadoff hitters that you remember? Growing up or more in more recent times for the Cardinals, 855-282-8255, 855-282-8255. When I was a kid growing up in Baltimore, I mean, uh, Earl Weaver liked uh, – one of his leadoff guys was Al Bumbry. Oh, yeah. He was, he was kind of short. He was. Right? And then um, Don Buford, he was kind of short. Um, I'm trying to think who else. They had a guy named Tom Chopay for a while who was short. I don't know him. Yeah, I know he wasn't yeah. exactly prominent, okay. but but uh, well, we got a couple of Vince Coleman's right away that were sent in. He's not short, is he? he wasn't five nine short, but he wasn't six three either. But yeah, that's I. Card. I'm trying to think of any. I mean, there was a time now, not necessarily leadoff man, but every shortstop was five nine and weighed about what one fifty <laughs> at best. I mean, there's right. a whole group of those guys. 
Yeah, Coleman's listed at at at, at, a, at six foot even. And listen, I've been in his presence a, a lot of times, even going back to when he was a player, and even when he was a player for the Mets. And I never, you know, I never really he, he didn't seem short to me. You know, even even though six being an even six foot's not exactly like you know it doesn't make you um, Nate Thurman or anything, but uh, you know it, it's still I I don't I don't know if I don't consider that short. That's like medium. I got a Tony Womack that was sent in. He was kind of short, yeah. Another one says Fernando Vina. He was short. Oh, that's a really good one. I should, yeah. And technically, let's go to the baseball reference ruling. Uh, five nine, yes, sir. Uh, yeah, he would be short. <laughs> five nine. The picture uh, of him getting run over by Albert Bell will never go away. Uh, Tony Womack was uh, five nine. There you go. We're okay. two for two. There you go. We're two for three. Because I don't consider Coleman short. All due respect. I mean, we're having fun here. But someone's got to be the judge, right? Yes. <laughs> uh, Joe uh, McEwing? Let's see. Yeah, he was – my guess on him is going to be about um, 5'11". Oh, I was off, 5'10". 5'10", okay. Yeah. He qualifies then. I th- yeah, he's kind of borderline. See, that's what, like that's the whole thing. It's like, what do we define as short, right? Because we didn't define it. No, that's true, but – that. That's that's uh, if you're under five ten maybe or or if, if you're under six foot I don't I, I just don't know what's fair. Yeah, I. But I mean, they're not Newt Bar short. I mean, they're not Newt Bar tall. So right there you go. Or that's Dylan right, Carlson or one of those guys. It's definitely that that whole position has definitely changed over the years, which in turn kind of goes back to our Hall of Fame conversation. The that's game right. changes. The positions, everything changes. You got to look at it different. Kurt Flood let off before Lou Brock. We are told here on the text line. And I don't know how tall Kurt Flood was. You know what I forgot to ask, Kamish? Um, and there's plenty of time to talk about this. You know, mm-hmm. the Cardinals had their all of their Hall of Fame meeting, the Red Ribbon Committee. Uh, I was I wasn't able to go to the meeting, but they they were kind enough to let me still vote. Because they know I do all this homework and everything, right? So, I'll just say this, and I have no idea, and I'm not being a phony. I have no idea what the sentiment in the meeting room was because I wasn't there, and I'm not going to ask anybody. You know, just going to respect their privacy, right? But um, when we're talking about the veterans committee, it, it it is what it implies. It's not like someone that played for the Cardinals in the '90s or the '80s, or you know, it 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 go it goes back a ways, right? And um, the, the guy, and I know that I'm, I'm switching topics here before we take a take a break, but mm-hmm. the the guy to me that really needs to be in there, and he's uh, no longer with us, uh, is uh, Whitey Kurowski, the third baseman from the '40s. I mean, he, I, I don't have the whole thing in front of me, but I got a whole, I, I got about five notebook pages and notes on him. Really? Okay. And maybe I'll maybe I'll brief that. Uh, I'll do that you know, next week sometime for for the people that really appreciate the Cardinals history. But, you know, he was a, he, he was a five-time All-Star. Uh, he was on those, you know, a couple of those World Series teams. I mean, he was a highly regarded player. You know, I, um, I, I really good defensively. And, you know, he had some power. I mean, his numbers were good. He, uh, he, he just jumped out at me as the guy on that list that seemed to be were overdue for him, you know, overdue to get in. And I, and you know, and I know he's got a lot of family around, so they would really appreciate it. But you know, we you didn't see him play. No, I didn't I, see I'd him like play. to hear those numbers because I don't. I mean, I know the name, but I don't know the history. You know? Yeah, and, and maybe if some of our old timers. And by the way, when I use that term, it's a term of endearment. So don't take it personally if I if you're one of the old timers. But uh, and if you know, and and any thoughts on on him by just people that uh, were either fortunate enough to see him play or just know a lot about him. But he was uh, he was a really good player. I mean, I don't you know there, I don't know how many five time All Stars, um, five time All Star among Cardinals, and that's one thing I didn't look up. That's impressive. That's a that's a lot. It that's is more than you think. You know, very much so. So anyway, Kurt Flood was five nine, so yes, he would qualify because he was the leadoff man before Lou Brock. So my guy Cadillac says Delino to Shields. Oh, he's kind of short. Yeah, yeah, I like that one. Good call. Yeah. I think that is a good call. That's that's why he's Cadillac, man. 
<laughs> he always he always drives through. He's got it, he right? Drives through. I like it. Yes, he does. He drives through.